This is a free preview of the latest Physio Tutors Masterclass. Watch it now on the Physio Tutors app. Hello and welcome. It is my great pleasure to present this session to you today for Physio Tutors. First kind of thing we're going to think about is the components of strength and conditioning um, to assist in the optimization of exercise prescription for your rehabilitation. So now, if we're thinking about bridging that gap, okay, so we're bridging the gap from the person being a patient to them being an athlete. If we go from a athlete setting, for example, and we're thinking about um, that individual within that setting, what are the elements that are required for successful performance? And they could be the key things that a coach, an SNC, etc., cetera, are uh, contemplating when they're designing their training programs. And we'll probably have uh, things that relate to physical performance, strength, speed, agility, etc., psychological um, performance and uh, capabilities here, resilience, and again, there might well be a psych on board in that MDT, certainly at elite levels. Nutritional strategies, of course, um, coaching as well. So there's quite a lot of things and a, a lot more, I'm sure. And now if we think about from a rehab perspective, from a, um, a clinical perspective, what are the elements required for successful rehabilitation? They're not dissimilar, are they? We still want to restore strength into the musculature. We still want that in, uh, uh, individual um, to be able to encounter those uh, stresses and strains associated with performance latterly in the rehabilitation program. There's obviously psychological components, etc. But the thing that you have to contend with uh, that, again, seeks to dis disrupt those optimized prescriptions is I suppose, injury and healing and tissue properties that might be um, less resilient than that individual who, when they're in their peak performance. So if, as I said, if you are a part of that multidisciplinary team, um, we need this blended approach between rehabilitation, physiotherapy, and strength and conditioning and the athletic performance. And we so you have many opportunities to bridge this gap. And the gap really being from that individual there who's injured to that individual there who is returning to play, is returning to sport, is returning to competition. Or indeed, this is also applicable for individuals that are not athletes. They have to go back to be resilient against the normal kind of loadings that their, their daily life uh, presents to them. So along this rehabilitation, this, this this journey, we might have an individual who is becomes injured. They might have a surgical intervention. There will be a program, hopefully, of rehabilitation. And then we're looking to deliver that individual back to their environment. So it could be returned to play. Now, you have a multitude of opportunities along here to optimize the interventions that you're using in terms of outcome to attenuate loss and also to improve performance um, development. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider kind of four points along this journey and strategies that you can use at each of these time points to help optimize that, that bridging. And let's just acknowledge it. This is talking about exercise design and prescription, really. There are many reviews that have come out recently uh, amalgamating the, the evidence uh, in this arena. Now, there's several, and now the, the consensus, if you like, we can achieve other metrics of performance or other characteristics like hypertrophy with various recipes of reps and sets. But in order to optimize, so maximizing that input-output equation of you with your patient and your patient with your exercise, those higher intensity, higher loads are where strength adaptation is optimized. Now, this is an old version of this repetition, maximum continuum. And the size of text indicates at this stage the size of response. Now, to validate, I suppose, that the research validates this bit here. So strength is optimized, really, that three to five repetitions maximum. It's pretty heavy. And actually, it probably doesn't matter if you've got one or two left in the tank if you're lifting that heavy. And that's not to say you won't go to an adaptation if you do more repetitions with a lighter weight. It just won't be as great in terms of the adaptation. But we can have something to say about these other things here. Now, what is rate of force development? Well, it's commonly called muscle power. It's not the same thing, but they are related. Rate of force development refers to the slope of that force time curve. So if you were to do a strength test 
and somebody here is kind of relaxed and then we shout go at them, they kick up or they push or pull, depending what muscle you're uh, assessing uh, against a load cell, could be handheld, uh, and they produce their maximal force. You ask them to hold it and then relax. Now that's the strength, the peak is the peak force, is the muscular strength. Now the way in which they get there is rate of force development. It's the slope of that force time curve. Now, is this important? Well, yes, it is important. So to be a little bit more explicit, the non-concurrent group, they did exactly the same as the uh, concurrent group, which was the published OCEL um, rehabilitation program, which we've um, uh, designed in, in Oswestry. But uh, the non-concurrent group did the heavy-based exercise on a separate day. Okay, so they did the cardiovascular endurance on one day and they did the uh, strength-based stuff on the other. Everybody did the same. What did we see? Sorry, this is a small graph. <laughs> so the, everybody started roughly, so this is knee flexors, peak force, similar data for rate of force development and for knee extensors. We saw that everybody's roughly the same at baseline, but then you see in this group here, this is um, around about six weeks post-surgery. Um, We've got a significant reduction in muscular strength in the group that didn't do concurrent training. Uh, sorry, that did do concurrent training. When we split it out, that in the, that group was superior. And not only was it at this time point, but you can see it across all time points. Indeed, right to the end of that rehabilitation program. So at the end, in the flexors, so the hamstrings were uh, 13, 14 percent weaker. Okay, so strength deficits pre uh, prevalent, problematic. What might we have um, in terms of concern here if we're getting individuals back into a sport-specific setting where we're expecting, again, this is bridging the gap, but at this point, we're probably working with, if we have that, that uh, um, you know, that, that luxury of working with an SNC coach and um, performance-based coaches, they're probably in and out of the clinic and in and out of the gym, but maybe mainly in the gym, um, and rehabilitation is becoming less and less of a focus. But from your perspective, you're thinking about sport-specific training, of have they got still the ability to be resilient to those stresses, thinking about those perturbations, twisting, changing direction? Now, what might be happening at this moment in time with a ramping up of training? Your concerns might be the tissue response and thinking about exercise induced muscle damage, delayed onset muscle soreness as the symptom of that. Uh, the, and that can then influence their response to perturbation. So if you're carrying over a big deficit of performance caused by a sudden ramping up in training volume, and then you go back onto the field of play, clinically you're going to be thinking, hopefully, um, that's probably not the best situation um, to do within 24, 48 hours because of the unpredictability of the situation that they might be going into, thinking about the ground, thinking about the training they're going to be doing, are they um, training within a team, etc. Okay, so quite a lot to think about there. Um, where do we put all of this uh, in our rehabilitation planning? Okay, so just to acknowledge that all of the things that we've talked about here are achievable without high-tech equipment and um, achieved through through understanding the basic principles. So if we think about somebody's adaptive potential, and that might be, you know, this little block here, the majority of that is going to be achieved through understanding fundamental principles and delivering them, being specific with the rehab, getting the exercise design correct, and then you maybe can even push that boundary even further by using some of the strategies that we've talked about along that rehabilitation pathway uh, to optimise even better your touch points. Thereafter, then we can start to lean on science. Once we've exhausted those possibilities or we're more cognizant and aware of what the uh, possibilities are, maybe the limitations, then we can start to think about the adjuncts, uh, science and technologies. And maybe we think about electrical simulation at some points, maybe we're thinking about blood flow restriction and they all absolutely have a place, but it must not, it, they must not um, replace the fundamentals and the basic principles for exercise design prescription, and also acknowledging the importance of the individual and their psychology uh, to enable them to buy into your amazing prescriptions. 
So I hope you've enjoyed this session. It's been my absolute pleasure to present this to you and um, feel free to reach out with any questions.